We okay? I'm going to our meeting now, and I welcome you all to our meeting. Glad to see you here. The minutes have been submitted and passed around, I think. Okay. You will be. I have some packets. Last minute submissions. Last minute printing on my part. Sorry, but done the best I can. I was absent at the last meeting, and Florence very kindly. Minutes for me, did a wonderful job. Then, uh, thank you very much. For <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, the regular meeting of the Cobb County Genealogical Society is called to order by President Jimmy Searcast at 2.02 p.m. on March 9th. Members were present, including officers Vicki, Anita, Florence, and members Donna Barley, Don Lenard, and Pat Pearson. Four guests attended. Brian and Terry Johnson, the president's report stated that seven persons attended the February 6th meeting, plus two additional people attended online. Additional president report content. See copy of the March 9th, 2024 president's report <coughs> attached. Treasurer Florence Gerard, getting balance of 1695 30 deposits of $479, expenses of $75, and the current balance of 2099. No additional officer reports prepared. Unfinished business included discussion of the Great Cross and Library Board of Trustees meeting held March 5th at 5 p.m. with CCGS President Vicki Sear Katz. Two CCGS members attended, Gail Hathorne and Eunice Peters. <coughs> The purpose of the meeting was to determine whether the CCGS genealogical holding placed at the FCL, or Public Great Cross Library, FCL, uh, would continue to be housed at the FCL. President Sear Katz presented a memorandum of understanding, which we have shortened to MOU, to memorialize a new agreement, previously practiced in the Gentleman's Agreement for the founding of the CCGS. Yes, in November 1977 to present day, when the CCGS placed its genealogical books, records, and papers at the FCL so the community of Calcutta and Kansas could have free access to the genealogical records created by and for its pioneer settlers and their descendants, the current citizens of Calcutta. The discussion of that FCL board meeting, which lasted about 25 minutes, Covers specifics of the size of the collection. Now, <coughs> approximately two records from. The need of both parties to control the size of the collection in terms of the space it occupies in the FCL and the intention to work together through the librarians of both organizations in mutual agreement before releasing any books or papers needing to be duplicated or betrayed to safely handle or be on display on the public library shelves. A small number of items brought from the storeroom of the FCL was made available to CCGS to transfer into their custody at the Cloud County Historical Society Museum 
which transfer was agreed to take place on March 6, 2024. After opening the meeting to discussion of all present, it was discovered that the FCL board president, Laura Watson, was under the impression the CCGS genealogical collection was the property of the Frank Carlson Library. Gail. This idea, which the CCGS rejects entirely, necessitated the delay of signing the MOU, pending research on the ownership of the CCGS genealogical holdings at the FCL. It was agreed the MOU would be revisited in 30 days at the next board meeting on April 2, 2024. Why don't you come up here and you want me to, oh, okay. yeah, I that way the no, but the people online could hear you then. Okay, sure. So that would that would be better. Discuss um, was the discussion of the proposed cloud epitaphs program to be presented by CCGS. The cemeteries proposed are in Miltonvale, Miltonvale Cemetery, Thomas Cemetery, Phelps Cemetery, Oakland Union Cemetery, and St. Peter's Cemetery, on Highway. Cemetery, also called the French Presbyterian Church Cemetery. The program will include the names of the families buried in each cemetery and a brief history of a few prominent Civil War veterans, since they are some of the first settlers in Cloud County. We will try to hire OCC buses to shuttle the attendees around to the cemeteries. History and narratives will be shared during the bus drive time along with handouts about the cemeteries, communities, and individuals. The next meeting will be on Saturday, April 13th, 2024 at 2 p.m. with the program to be presented by Deb Miller, CCGS member and DAR member, about the Northern Cheyenne Exodus Trail. Meeting adjourned at 2.23 p.m. Diana Sterzenick dean presented the program Researching Your Home and the People Who Live There. The program carried live stream and presented with energy and excellent handouts full of helpful links was very well received and sparked lively conversations afterwards. Five new members joined and refreshments were served. Yeah, will have one. So. Um, Does anybody want to move to that those are accepted? Is there any discussion? I'll move to accept. Okay. You second it? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's been moved and it's seconded. The minutes are accepted. Um, do we have a treasurer's report? Um one of the things we need to decide on is previously in the past, all we ever was what the balance was. So uh, like the previous meeting, we included the amounts coming in and the amounts going out. So we need to decide how we want that information, whether it's just the balance you guys want to know or what, what other information. $2,032.41. And we have one new member. So what do we think? I, I propose that we list the beginning balance, the deposits, the expenses, and the ending balance. And that makes it just a clear snapshot from month to month exactly how we're progressing. Yeah, I, I that sounds good. Is that everybody's agreement? Yeah. All the members? Need to vote on it. Let's vote on that. Uh, everybody say aye that agrees with that. Aye. And the no's? The eyes carry. Okay. Uh, executive board reports. They're listed in the, the minutes. No, I, 
the agenda that says your president's report is next. I don't, an executive board report? Well, we always give president report and yeah. Are they listed in your minutes? The president's report is a sample form. Yeah. Okay. So do you want us to give them? Excuse me? So should we give them now? Do you? It's not, it wasn't on my agenda. I don't know. You're the president. Please do you tell us what's good. So we had um, a board meeting with the um, um, library board again for our, the signing of the MOU, the motion of understanding. And they did go ahead and sign that with us. So we are under a one-year contract with them that our books are safe with them. They will not be moved. They will not be gone through by the library without Ashley's approval. Uh, she and Lindsay, the librarian, will work closely together. And uh, anything that is sorted out will be sorted out by the two of them together and not just the librarian over there. Uh, we did find some books that belong to the orphan train, and Ashley will tell you about those. Um, those were dealt with. Um, we were, were pleased to find out that the library would sign, the library board would sign that MOU with us because that takes a lot of pressure off of us. So we don't have to worry about scurrying around trying to find the space for our books. It was exhausting. Yeah, it was very exhausting. Um, Yeah. Do you, do you mind if I say something? Sure. In regards to that, um, my name is Lindsay Metcalf, and I came for the presentation of the Frank Carlson Library Board. And I just want to reassure everyone that there was never any plan to move the geneal genealogical records. Um, we appreciated the communication, but they're safe. Um, and we recognize, and we have always recognized that they belong to the Genealogical Society. But it's it's good to have it in writing now. It we is. All agree. Um, and it was, we were very frantic at one point because we were searching for a place. We thought we had to find a place to put them and there just isn't a place that's large enough. Yeah. And, and I think that communication is always good and it's unfortunate there was a miscommunication, but there has, there has never been a plan to move anything. And so I'm glad that we've got it sorted out. Yeah. Us too. We're very thankful for that. So thank you. Um, it, it just takes a lot of burden off of us to have it in writing. Mm -hmm. So I think both sides it does. Sure. Um, I think next is our plan for our next program is next month, and that is going to be Bruce Johnston, who is Marilyn Johnston's son. He's her oldest son, and he's going to give us a speech a program about how the Genealogical Society got started because he helped his mom when she got involved with it at the very beginning. And they will give us a, a talk about how they started the Genealogical Society from his perspective. So it ought to be pretty good. He's, he's quite the talker. He, he's, uh, he's full of information, that's for sure, just like his mom was. She was quite the lady. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the vice president. Do you have anything to report? No. 
I'm just glad to see everyone here to see this program. It's exciting. And um, if they return and better friend. Yeah. Secretary? Okay. And I think before it's should I come up front? Yeah, <laughs> probably a good idea. I've got a few packets ready here. Sorry, that's true. You're welcome. Thank you so much. It's more like a permanent. Yeah. Bruce? Bruce? We have some more too if you like one just stop by on your way out. Okay, Secretary's report today, April 13th. Um, I wanted to report on the monthly meeting notices that go into the blade. They were printed three times for this April meeting. After reading with chagrin, the blades misstatement of our society name, having printed it as Cloud County Genealogy Society, instead of Cloud County Genealogical Society, which is the name of our society now, um, I wrote an email that caught their attention. And the result was a very gratifying program announcement uh, and a correct mention of the upcoming meeting section announcement. So uh, I think we're on the same page now with that. Very happy to see it. Uh, with their new publication schedule of the Blade once, once a week now that's sent out via mail, um, the new deadline schedules are in place finally, and they are significantly sooner than what we have worked with before. So now we have to have, if we want to um, in for this week, we would have had to send it by Wednesday a week ago. And no later, if you send it in Friday, you probably won't get in, you know, that sort of thing. Notwithstanding, um, <laughs> however, there were no club meetings or organization meetings um, in their in their most recent issue that went out this Thursday. So I think they're they're trying to learn how to fit all the information that they used to three issues into one. And it, you know, so it'll probably be a, a bit of a, a juggling act for a little while until everybody gets with the new schedule there with the blade. Um, and then I, I mentioned that I post the, um, the meeting announcements and the program announcements um, online as well at the Cloud County Historical Society Museum page and the Cloud County Genealogical Facebook page. And also, you know you're from Concordia, Kansas, if blah, 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 that one page and my own page. I do that two weeks before the meeting, and then I do it again the week before the meeting, Tuesday or Wednesday, so that it's pretty close to time, so people could still add it to their calendars if they need to. And um, then program flyers, which Vicki likes to go around and spread the good news of what great program we have coming up, which I'm looking forward to today. Um, the discovery that the Frank Carlson Library President, Laura Watson, believed our genealogical records uh, housed on the shelves of the library to be the property of the library prompted investigation of the origins of this community service practiced by CCGS. And in response to what you said, it, it was what she said at that meeting. So that, that put us in alarm because it was an idea we had never entertained. We always knew it was our property and we just wanted to make sure that that was correct. But having the way it was done back then, everything was gentlemen's agreement. And so, you know, I think it's wonderful. We're putting it in writing now and, and laying a good groundwork for all our future work together. Um, anyway, that, that, inspired me to get in touch with some of our older members and original members. 
And that was just a fascinating process. Um, wow, we, we have huge shoes to fill. They did a, just a tremendous job with this society. And we have a huge responsibility to reignite that passion and creativity. And we're, we're on our way. But it's getting started is, is tricky. There's lots of bumps along the way. But I think we're doing pretty well. Um, and then I mentioned the investigation continues. It will. Because I want to I go, I wanna get as much more as I can find. But um, so in your packet, those of you who have one, you'll see a couple pictures on the back. And one is a picture of, um, of the very first meeting that we had uh, that was published in the Kansan. And it just says the first meeting was held of the um, Republican Valley Genealogical Society. And I thought, well, at first I thought, well, that's got to be wrong. And then the Chubbuck sent me uh, the picture of Ralph Chubbuck um, receiving, the first president receiving a check for $100 in, in, I think, April of their first year, which April 1978. And it mentions how he is going to use that $100 check to buy books for the libraries so that our, our collection begins. And the first article, so it names the name of the first person who donated a book for our collection, which I thought it really shows that our genealogical holdings have been near and dear from the very first minute that this organization, organization was founded. So um, anyway, I'm looking forward to our program next month as well, when Bruce Johnson will tell us, I think, about how, how it is we came to switch names. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Now our librarian will give us an update. I will try to make this quick and painless. I know we're all excited about this program. So come up here, hon. Oh, I'm gonna make you do that. Mm -hmm. I guess. I guess. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Ashley Hay, the librarian for the Genealogical Society. Um, I will just read you what I have. This was um, my report for this one. Um, CCGS officers Ashley, Vicki, Gail, and Anita, and members Wendy, I do not know how to pronounce her last name, <laughs> what she said, and um, Bruce Nutter were all in attendance at the library board meeting on Tuesday, April 2. 2024 at the Frank Carlson Library, um, where it was agreed that the MOU would be signed by both parties. Um, a copy of the MOU as edited at the CCGS Executive Board meeting on April 7 to express the interest of um, the CCGS more clearly is attached and will be signed um today by myself and Vicki, um, and then at a later date by Laura and Lindsay. Um, the change that was made in this agreement clarified that um, we would provide a list of holdings to the library, but not code it as the Frank Carlson Library property. Um, and... It was also learned earlier this month, um, Vicki touched briefly on this, that there was a section of our collection at the library that actually belonged to the Orphan Train Museum. So the library director, Lindsay, and myself um, at noon today went and delivered that to the Orphan Train Museum. And um, it was not the lady that you talked about one it was carol and she did not feel comfortable signing in that capacity at that time so um she's going to give it to the correct person to sign and then we will have that as soon as they do um i think so um and then vicky and myself went to the library um thursday evening um april 11 
And we decided that it's probably best to push back the cataloging of all the material until we can pull some of those old newsletters and periodicals out of there. Um, I don't want to make my job any harder <laughs> because it's already a task. So we're just going to push that back for right now. And I will start getting a list together of all of the periodicals and the newsletters. And um, I'm going to present that at the board meeting for the library next month. Um, and then, okay, taking into consideration all of the negotiations that have been happening between the library and ourselves. Um, since we are moving things to the museum here, um, I propose that we get also an MOU between the Cloud County Historical Museum Board and ourselves just to have it in writing, just how we're doing with the library, just so everything is well documented and it's right there in writing. Mm -hmm. that that's good. all I have. Quick and painless as possible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and our historian, do you have anything you want to say? I'm just putting an article in once a month with the newspaper, and I put it in uh, according to the old rules and found out it didn't go in this week. But one of the things I've learned is I live 150 miles away at least, and when I try to do an article, if I'm doing it from a genealogical standpoint is I'm not able to find the information that I want on Cloud County history. And I walked into the library today and when I looked at that library, I thought somebody up here needs to be doing this because they can get more information. They can walk in the library and get a plethora of information that I don't have access to. So uh, I'll just let that lie where it needs to be. But uh, this month it was on Bon Marche. I loved that store when I was growing up. Uh, did I buy anything there? Absolutely not. I couldn't <laughs> afford it. But my grandmother would go in there with me and I would show her what I loved and she would go home and sew it for me without a pattern. So it just became my favorite store because of that. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all. I appreciate it. Okay. Unfinished business. We are, get, well, we, Gail, is basically continuing to find old records from previous board members. She's been really working on that hard, and she's done a really good job. Um, she has gotten a lot of information on old records from previous members. Um, we need a couple more people at least to sign up with Ashley for her her committee I started a paper I think it was going around maybe um, okay I signed up sheet um, I just printed it um, this morning but I thought that might help and if people could leave me their contact information then I can get in touch with them and figure out when is a good time any volunteers are very appreciated yeah, it's it's just for a few hours at a time at the library to catalog that collection. Um, it's voluminous and it's oh, it's really daunting that collection is. Uh, once we get through those periodicals, I think it's not going to look so bad. But right now, it's really it's kind of scary looking. And we just need people that will volunteer to to help catalog things. So sign up or talk to Ashley. And new business. The only thing I have is we need to decide if we want to sell something at the water and what and do we want to try to sell shirts or caps or what would we want to sell I like the shirts idea 
because we're going to have to come up with it so they can get. Right. I think a shirt is something that everybody will always want, right? Everybody Seems to be. Yeah. Can you make money on a shirt? Probably. If people, right? I mean, enough people buy shirts, then yeah, even cheap. I mean, everybody wants to keep What do you think, Don? You were thinking hard over there. Well, uh, you know, I couldn't hear what you said either, but <clears throat> during the Watermelon Festival, the Chamber of Commerce does sell hats and shirts, caps and shirts. So we might have a problem with marketing on that. I really don't know what would really be good. Um, It would, that would be some, that would be something that uh, can be done. What about cups? Cups might go. I'll tell you what my great grandchildren really enjoyed was balls. Balls? Yeah, little little balls, but that, they can throw around. You could have the, you know, your name on them. Yeah. Or frisbees. Frisbees. Or, uh, That's an idea. You could try caps and shirts, but I, it's like they say, they they sell them. the chambers and clients sells them also. Plus yeah. A lot of the vendors. And the There'll vendors. A lot of that stuff. There's a lot of vendors. Yeah. Because there will probably be five thousand people there. Yeah, I know. It's a very busy day or weekend. And they're planning more for this year. Are they? Yeah. Who do I get a hold of, Jamie? Uh, uh, Art Baker is the new president of the chamber. He's the uh, superintendent. Okay. Clyde, Clifton Clyde Schools. Okay. <clears throat> Add a thought to that, Vicki. One, and I don't know how well this would go over here, but you know, when you think of a genealogy group, you think of all of us are addicted to books anyway, right? And so, book bags are handy uh, in other organizations that we've had. Uh, they've also, been, you know, a lot of people use them now for groceries instead of doing the plastic oh, or, yeah. the, or the paper. They they like those kind of books, but it's just it's one of those. The cost would be more probably in the range that you would think of with a shirt. It wouldn't be quite so outrageous. You might have a better profit margin. That's true. And you and I had talked before about giving away a family tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be fun too. Be fun. Raffling the family tree. Huh? How about raffling the family tree? Yeah, that would be fun. We could do that too. A lot of people don't know where to start when it comes to doing genealogy and if you can it, it would be a way to get their attention you know and if they buy a raffle ticket for it that'd be great good idea does anybody else have any new business they want to talk about otherwise i'm going to turn it over to deb they want to ask people to ride a bus and they want high and ice cream on them yeah, we're going to have uh, the talking epitaphs of Cloud County. And uh, that's going to be in June instead of May. But we're going to have to be on a bus probably. And we got a bus from USD 333. But uh, we need to kind of get a head count of how many people would go. It's going to be, we're going to go down to the cemeteries towards Mountainville to start with. And how many cemeteries did we end up with? Six. Yeah, 
Saturday of the month. Yeah, it's on the 15th of May. And we were looking at maybe having the restaurant down there that really good at making pies, maybe we could get done at the Mountain Mill Cemetery, go to the park and have pie and ice cream there before we come, come back and hit the other ones on the way back. Yeah, we thought we'd take a little break on the way and have pie and ice cream at the park. So we need to know what type of flavors you like and... They make good pie too. That's <laughs> Sounds so good. I had a question. <clears throat> yeah. On the uh, that uh, in here, it stated that the uh, on Highway Twenty Four, Two Stone Cemetery also called the French Presbyterian Church Cemetery? We found out differently. Yeah, okay. Because that is south of St. Joe. Right. Two miles a minute. A mile it's over by Como. Well, uh, well, south of St. Joe, but it actually would be going west instead of east to go to Como. They, we, uh, it was listed in Find a Grave as the French Presbyterian. Yeah. Did you find anything? Yeah. You did. There are two little stones. Yeah, yeah I think they were in the world by Miltonville. Yeah. Well, along the highway. Sort of, kind of, by Miltonville. Well, this the one on the highway used to be Star Center Cemetery. And then when the court got built, a lot of that stuff got moved. So you've actually got the cemetery with two hips on well, well, it was the farmers loud them up. Loud them up. Wow. Destroyed it. So that was not the, the French Presbyterian. No, it not ended that up way. not being. It's, it's misdone in finding her. Yeah, it's mis misstated. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's just like even trying to find out if the Meredith had a, a cemetery. And it sounded like, I think we decided it did, but all those got moved to the different grave sites, too. So. Well, is that one that's down there on the south side of the road by Meredith? Is that, was that Meredith? Um, what cemetery was that? That's the Catholic Cemetery. Well, you have the Catholic Meredith? Cemetery on the highway, where the yeah. church used to say they moved the church over there west of Melbourne. So that's the St. Peter's yeah. And uh, Meredith was what, two sections on um, section two section of south of the St. Peter's one. But the, I mean, sometimes it seemed like they were referring to the cemetery, but then every time it seemed like then they turned up and they were buried somewhere else. And um, then uh, Heber, I always thought where Heber was, I thought it was school. And Heber would be there on. Uh, Highway 24 on the north side on the corner, uh, east of uh, the, the Union, uh, Oakland Union, yeah, the Oakland Union uh, Cemetery. So, thank you for inviting me today to speak. I'm a member. My name is Deb Miller. I'm a new member. Um, I'm a retired engineer. When I grow up, I want to be a historian, but I'm evolving. I'm not there yet. So I'm a researcher and a storyteller. I've been a storyteller my whole life, but I promise you I've learned to keep it to the facts as much as I know. So when I was a little kid. That wasn't always the case. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the Northern Cheyenne Exodus. Um, and this is the book that um, we found to be the most reliable um, as you, as you, you know, you were talking about find a grave and they list things or you get an ancestry and they list things and you find out some of it's wrong. And we've been talking about a lot of things and you find out that's not even correct or people will come up and, and I will tell you, I'm not hundred percent positive about most of this stuff, but, um, I'm basing it on what's in this book. So, um, based on this book, 
this is how Vernon Maddox described it. So that's pretty, I actually have a couple um, sources that I used. One's a military source. There's another book, this book, and, and some articles that most of my facts have come out of. So, I, I mean, I feel pretty good about the facts. Some of the ancillary stories, I believe they're true. I hope they're true. Um, I also have um, put on the tables our business card. It's listed for both of us. We like to travel around the state and tell different stories. And um, they have to do with a lot of things about the trails and about the Northern Cheyenne. And um, anyway, so this is our business card. We both have the same card. So um, I will tell you that my obsession started with genealogy. I can blame this all on genealogy. When I was a little girl, I heard these stories from my family and I couldn't wait to research them. And I heard that my, my family traded on the Santa Fe Trail. When I met Dee, she was she was the national um, chair of the Santa Fe Trail for the DAR. And lo and behold, I found out that my family did actually trade on the Santa Fe Trail. I apologize for this map. This is not, it's hard to read. I know it's hard to read. But if you look at this map, this is the 1800s. These are the trails that are in Kansas. And the reason that I bring this up is... In, in the 1800s, this is kind of where all of this, all of this is connected. It's, it's extremely connected. In 1803, we bought the, the Louisiana Purchase, and Kansas is part of this Louisiana Purchase. Right after that, they sent out Lewis and Clark, and you, you can't see it, but here, that was where they, they did their expedition to find the Northwest Passage. Later on, the, the, our whole history of the state is a story of trails. Um, if you follow this trail here, you'll recognize that as the Santa Fe Trail, a major trading avenue. Um, this trail right here, um, that's the trail to the gold. That's the Smoky Hill Trail. Lots of stories on it. And you can't see it very well, um, but this trail right here that comes up, through Ashland, Cimarron, near Scott City, and goes up. That that is the trail that we're talking about today, and it's the it's the Northern Cheyenne Exodus. Um, another trail that you'll find on this map is well, you'll find well, you can see the Pikes Trail, Cattle Trails, you know, all kinds of trails. The Oregon Trail. Um, you've all heard of the Chisholm Trail. It's on there. It's not nationally designated did you know that it's not it's not nationally designated yet we're hoping that the northern exodus trail and the northern cheyenne troops are or their tribe is working on this that they get national designation but you know how long we've been talking about the chisholm trail you've seen the markers it's not designated yet but as soon as the the northern cheyenne exodus trail gets national designation, then you, you'll start seeing a lot more and it's a tourist thing. But, um, you know, we have westward expansion happening in the 1800s. The Indians are being pushed out and they're fighting back. All of these trails, there's, there's military posts all along the way to protect the people and the traders and the settlers. And this is where all these skirmishes were happening. And a lot of the skirmishes were with the Cheyenne Indians. The Southern Cheyenne didn't really live. The Northern Cheyenne didn't live here either. They lived up North. The Southern Cheyenne lived in Oklahoma, but a lot of the skirmishes involved the Northern Cheyenne. So just put that in the back of your head. This is all coming to a head in the 1800s. And I love it. Um, So, um, and, and I have to condense so much of this in order to fit it into the short amount of time, so I apologize for that. But I hope that you might be interested and you'll do a little more research or maybe get this book because it's, it's a fascinating story. But you've all heard about um, the Sioux Wars, the Indian Wars, and um, the Battle of Little Bighorn. Um, and, and some of the situations that led to the Northern Cheyenne being um, 
forced to move down to the reservation. So some of the some of the things that happened were uh, when you look at the Northern Cheyenne, they're actually separate from the Southern Cheyenne. They're not they're not two they're not the same tribe. They're not even the same group. They have totally different leaders, totally different locations. The Northern Cheyenne, they lived up in the Montana area. Um, the Southern Cheyenne, like I said, lived in Oklahoma. The U.S. government did not consider them to be different. They thought you're Cheyenne, you're all together. And what would happen was when all these skirmishes started happening, the United States tried to do peace treaties with the different tribes. The, the chiefs went to Washington. The, the Indian agents worked so hard. Everybody worked so hard to, to get agreements. But I mean, to be perfectly honest, you're telling these people, get off the land. You can't have the, the bison anymore. Um, you know, and, and they weren't taking to that very well. So, but they made these peace treaties. A lot of the Indians, they didn't want to fight anymore. By the late 1800s, they were tired of fighting. They just wanted to be left alone on with their lifestyle. They didn't want to assimilate. The Southern Cheyenne signed a peace treaty with the U.S. government. The U.S. government contended that that was applicable to all the Cheyenne. But the Northern Cheyenne tribes didn't feel that they were bound by that peace treaty. They didn't feel like it applied to them at all. And so they continued to do the things that they were doing. They continued to hunt the bison. They continued to um, live like they did. Um, so after the Little Bighorn, um, the U.S. government told the tribes that they needed to go back to their reservation, go where they were assigned. And if they did not do that by a certain date, which was um, the end of January or something in, in 1876, if they weren't back by the end of January, they would be considered hostile. Well, the Northern Cheyenne and the Sioux, who were in their minds not connected to any of these treaties, they were out hunting, doing what they always did, living their life like they did, and they were declared hostile. And so the, the army set out to capture them, them and put them on the reservation. So this is just a timeline, just so you can get an idea. Um, in May of 1877, um, that's when the Northern Cheyenne were finally captured and they were moved to the reservation in Darlington, Oklahoma, which they did not want to be there, but they surrendered and they moved there. Then, as you can see, they, they on September of 1878 was when they decided to escape. And there's several battles that occurred. Finally, when it gets to um, January of 1879, part of the tribe is captured. Dull Knife and his people are captured. They surrender. And then a few months later, uh, Little Wolf and his people are captured and they surrender. So you're looking at a timeline of just like two years and their escape was really over the course of six months and they're on foot. So um, just this is the timeline of how, how it went. Um, an interesting story about um, prior to when this happened, um, you've all heard of the, the massacre at the Washita where the army came in and Custer was involved in this. And they, the tribes that they wiped out were mostly Southern Cheyenne, but Custer was there. And one of the, one of the Cheyenne leaders, his name was chief medicine arrows. Um, he was, they were smoking the peace pipe with Custer and I'm paraphrasing this. So, I mean, I'm just generalizing this, but they pretty much drew a line in the, in the ground and they told him, they told Custer, if you, we will kill you and we will have no mercy and it'll be a brutal death. Well, not that long after that, Custer attacked them at Little Bighorn and all of the Indians, the, the Sioux and the Cheyenne all were together on mass and they killed him intentionally. They were not going to have any mercy for him. And so, um, 
you know, it was very contentious between um, the military and the Indians. And but it got to the point where the Northern Cheyenne ran out of their their few in numbers. They they finally were surrounded. And they gave up and and they did go to their the reservation. They worked so hard. They they talked with their Indian agent and begged them, "We'll go to the reservation. Let just let us go north." And they wouldn't let them go. They had to go south. So. So where they ended up was near um, near Oklahoma City, and, and it was called the Darlington Agency, ran at the Darlington Reservation. Um, life at the Darlington Reservation was very difficult. First of all, they weren't even able to handle the people that they had. The Southern, um, the Southern Cheyenne, they didn't have enough food and supplies for the people they had. They didn't have enough money for the army that was there, um, the U.S. troops that were there. Um, the other thing that the, the U.S. government did at the same time, they really wanted to totally eradicate the Indian way of life. So they set out on a campaign to get rid of all the bison. And they darn now, well, almost succeeded. They, they were killing bison at a record level. And so the bison were getting wiped out um, the, the Northern Cheyenne come to the, to the agency, to the, uh, Darlington reservation, and there's not enough food and the soldiers, a lot of the soldiers that work there, they didn't even get paid for months at a time. They went a long time without even being paid. They weren't being fed. So they finally expanded and said, okay, well, you can, you can go to these bounds and you can hunt. And even when they did that, there wasn't a lot of food to find. There wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of, um, animals that, so they were starving. Um, once they got, once the Northern Cheyenne got there and then with the influx of all the settlers, they started getting, um, different malarial diseases and all kinds of cholera, all kinds of diseases that they had not been exposed to. Um, within the first two months, Almost two thirds became ill. Um, 41 Northern Cheyenne died of disease in the winter of 1877, 1878. So, I mean, there was less than, they started out with 973 and um, several died on the way to the agency. And then they were just, they were dying. The main, um, the main Northern Cheyenne leaders that decided to break out, these are the main um, chiefs and leaders. Uh, the first one is Dull Knife. Um, Dull Knife was a peace chief. Um, he was highly respected. He was old. He was, well, he was my age. He was 68 years old. Um, and, um, you know, he, he, he had done a lot in his lifetime. Um, chief Little Wolf was a military strategist. He was very sharp, military strategist. And um, when when they decided to do their escape, they would divide up. Dull Knife would go with the women and children. Um, Chief Little Wolf would go with the warriors and Wild Hog, same thing. And they would break up and try and um, confuse the army about where they were. And a lot of times they would go raise a ruckus over in one area over here while Dull Knife and the women escaped over here so they wouldn't be found. They didn't all stay together. You know, they, they would continually divide up and then meet back together. That was kind of one of their strategies. Um, Wild Hog was not a chief, but he was a um, Cheyenne, Northern Cheyenne dog soldier. And he was known as being kind of brutal. Um, he's probably later on in the story, you'll hear there's a lot of killings across Kansas and he's probably um, the main um, person who, who, who did that. Dull Knife didn't want to fight anymore. He didn't want to kill anybody. And if he was around, he would temper the warriors and ask them to please, you know, not, not do that. But um, we'll talk about the situation that, that caused all that. So, 
they finally got to the point where they couldn't stand it anymore. They were dying. They hated this area. They were starving and they wanted to go home. They petitioned with their Indian agent. They, he, they weren't being listened to. So they came up with some strategies about how they would break out. And what they did, Dull Knife would go way out. He would, they would disappear and they would leave their fires burning in their camp and they would go out to the far edges of where they were allowed to hunt. And it would appear that they had escaped. And then the army would rush out and they would find them in their allotted hunting ground. And so they would go back and think everything was okay. Well, they did that two or three times. On the third time, they really did escape. So the army wasn't too concerned about it. And then they realized, crud, they actually did it this time. So um, the, the man in charge, his name was Joseph, Captain Joseph Rendelbach. And so he left El Reno, he left the Darlington Reservation, the fort, and he set out to find them. And the first place that he encountered them was Turkey Springs. And this resulted in kind of a mild battle. Um, so Rendelbach caught up with Dull Knife and he sent, um, he sent a person in to talk with them and said, you, you need, Turkey Springs is in Oklahoma. We're not too far out of the reservation. And he says, you, you guys need to come back. And they said, no, thank you. And there were some skirmishes. The army pretty much had the Indians surrounded. They were flanked on both sides. And then all of a sudden, Rendelbach just decided, um, well, we're going we're gonna to retreat a little bit and regroup. And Dull Knife and, and they, they escaped. And so Rendelbach again continues on his pursuit. And at this time, they made it to Kansas. They crossed the Arkansas River or the Arkansas. I don't know how y'all say it here down in Wichita. We say Arkansas. But anyway, they crossed, they crossed the river. And um, anyway, when they, got to, when they got to Sand Creek, they had another skirmish. And again, the troops get the Indians almost surrounded. And again, Rendelbach retreats. So Dull Knife and, and the army continues on. And so by this time, the leader, the commander at Fort Dodge, his name is Lieutenant Colonel William Henry Lewis. <laughs> He's had enough. So he gets assigned to the case and and he's going to um, he's going to take over. Um, first, I have to tell you a little bit about Joseph Rendelbach. Um, so he he was the main person going after the Cheyenne until they got into Kansas. He retreated twice. Um, he earned the nickname um, Master of Retreat wasn't very, he was a very decorated soldier from the Civil War. He was from Germany. Well, he was, was when he was there, it was Prussia, but it was basically Germany. He, he was a career soldier. He enlisted after he came over here when he was 28. Um, he, he was discharged from his first service, honorable service, and he lived back again at Company G um, at Fort Leavenworth in the 1st Cavalry. He fought in the Civil War. He was a very brave and gallant warrior. Um, however, after Turkey Springs and Sand, Sand Creek, Sand Creek. Um, they decided that um, he, he was negligent in his duties and they court-martialed him. Uh, they didn't court-martial him until after, after the exodus was resolved, but um, because of those actions, he was court-martialed. Um, he, he was going to be, he was court-martialed. But before he was dismissed, typically what they do is they take those to the president. The president, the president was Rutherford B. Hayes, and he reviewed uh, Rendelbach's record, and he said, "Oh, he was a really, you know, honorable soldier." So he was allowed to um, retire from the army. the The dismissal was revoked. He was allowed to retire from the army. 
he retired on July 23rd, 1879 with full benefits of a, ba of a major. Um, a few weeks later, he joined his wife in Hoboken, New Jersey. They got on a ship out of New York and sailed back to Germany. Um, after he got there, <laughs> met up with his wife. He had one son. They had three more children. This guy was old. Had three, <laughs> had three more children in Germany. In 1886, his wife Louisa, Louise died. And she left her nearly invalid husband alone with four children, ages five to 12. And within two more years, he died and they left the children to his wife's brother. So um, the genealogy part of this, I like to go in and find everything I can. It's kind of hard to find some of these guys. I can't find a picture of them. I actually found a picture of Lewis, but it's in a place where I don't have permission to use it. So kind of have to find my own source. But anyway, um, this is all that I could find on Rendelbach, but um, I thought he was an interesting character. So anyway, we'll go back to the battle. So now um, Rendelbach is no longer, and it's Lewis. And if you remember, they, they passed through Southern Kansas and they're about in Western Kansas. And they come up to a place in Scott City. I don't know if any of you have ever been to it, but it's called Punish Woman's um, Fork. And it's a big canyon. And um, you can tell by this, it, it's full of that are in the canyon. And there's these rock outcroppings. And then um, there's a valley in between. It's a big canyon. And if you're if you're in those caves, you can you can see the military coming for miles you can see they're way out there so anyway the, the northern cheyenne are traveling up here they know this area well this is their hunting grounds this is they've been here so they strategically women and the children in the caves they plant different soldiers in um, different warriors in these rock outcroppings they build these little rifle pits and so um they decided to ambush the military well, Lewis was in charge, and he was he was a little bit more adept than than um, Rendelbach was, and so as they approached the canyon, it appeared to the military that it was empty. There was nobody there, but they were all there. And they were hiding. Now. One thing was that Lewis was a very good soldier and he suspected that were Indians hiding in the, in these caves, that, that they were gonna get ambushed. But he had no idea of the caliber of weapons that they had. As it turned out, when they were passing through the Ashland area, they had, um, was, when they escaped, they didn't have guns. They didn't have a lot of food. So all along the way, they'd had to, you know, steal food steal horses and sometimes they had to kill people to get the supplies that they needed so they had come across some buffalo hunters and they had stolen gotten their rifles and these were pretty powerful um, weapons um, i don't remember what caliber they were but 50 caliber, 50 caliber. Um, anyway lewis had no idea that the indians had this kind of and so he led the charge and he led right into the canyon and he was what his horse got shot out from under him. So he just continued on on foot and he was he was bravely leading the charge and he was shot. And it, as it turned out, he was shot through his femoral artery. He didn't die on scene, but he was critically wounded there. So the army withdrew and um, regrouped. Um, they took. Colonel Lewis, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis, and put him put him in a ambulance type thing, and they were taking him to Fort Wallace, and he died before he got there. Um, but everybody pulled back, and so the Indians, being strategic, they put all their ponies on one side, and they were on the other side, and they and they left them. They just left them there. And they escaped in the night. The army had no idea that that uh, Dull Knife and his his people would leave without their. They were these were packed with their food, their ponies, 
they did take some of them, but they left all their food and their horses behind. They had nothing, but they went in the night and it was a surprise. So they got a head start. They also kind of, it was one of those times where they divided up again and, and, uh, but they escaped. So um, the army had to regroup. Turns out that the Indians had left over 60 horses and the army took all their food and killed all their horses. So anyway, well, so now I'll have to tell you a little bit about Colonel Lewis, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis. So his name was William Henry Lewis. He was born in Alabama in 1829. Um, he graduated 15th in his class from West Point. He fought in the Civil War. He was never married. It's really hard to do a genealogy search on someone who never married and never had any kids. So the line kind of stops there with him. I said he had no reported children, but I mean, I can't be sure of that, but he never married and no one claims to have been any of his relatives. So after, after the Civil War, he became a major and he, he spent most of his career in the West, in Utah, and in Kansas fighting the Indians. He was very well versed in fighting the Indians. Um, like I said, he, he was assigned to Fort Dodge, very capable soldier. Um, and after he died at Fort Wallace, they buried him there. And then they took his remains and he was moved to a grave in Fort Edward, Washington County, New York. Apparently it's a pretty common thing to take you back to where your family was. So he was, he was moved and buried in New York. Um, another interesting thing about Lewis, um, he was born in Alabama and his family had slaves. When he went to Fort Dodge, he took a slave with him. And after he died, the slave was sent back to his family in Alabama, but he fought for the union side, I was just like, I don't get it. Sorry, a little commentary there, not, not necessary. <laughs> so I just found that to be very interesting. So, okay. The aftermath of Punished Woman's Fork was they had no food, they had no horses. These guys were desperate. They were so desperate, they would rather die than go back to the Darlington Agency. That's how bad it was. But they had no, they had no horses, they had no food. And so from Punish Woman's Fork up through the Oberlin area, up, up into Northwestern Kansas, it was, it was a very brutal time um, for the settlers that lived in Western Kansas. Um, it, it, there were a lot of skirmishes along the Sapa and, Be and Beaver Creeks and the people who lived there um, suffered just enormous tragedies because of the Northern Cheyenne. Um, a lot of the activity took place in Decatur and Meade counties. Um, 31 settlers were killed, houses were burnt, uh, women were raped. Um, it was just carnage. Um, it has been reported that no women were killed in these attacks. However, there were women that were raped and injured. Um, so, so this carnage continues up through Kansas and it continues on into Nebraska. Ultimately, the army catches up. The first group that they catch up with is um, Dull Knife's group. And they take them to a place near Fort Robinson and they decide to let them stay at Fort Robinson over the winter. Um, I think I need to go to the next slide. Oh, this is... And then, and then they catch Wild Hog and, and he's sent there. Um, they beg them to let them stay up north at Fort Robinson, but 
Um, they're not allowed to do that. So again, they, the thought of going back to the South, to the Southern reservation is just horrible to them. So they decide that they're gonna escape again. And this time the, the plan is that we would rather die than go back. Women with children, they would hold the children up for the children to be shot. They wanted to, they wanted to die. They didn't want to be captured again. So they decided that they were going to escape from Fort Robinson. So they, there was a lot of negotiations that went on, but they, they were denied. And so um, they, they held them prisoner. But what they did, they didn't trust the Indians anymore. So they put the men in one group of barracks and they put the women in another group. Now, every day they searched the men, but they didn't actually search the women. And the women, the women were walking around with parts of guns. They had guns attached to their clothes and they had guns that they would transport for. They would bury them in the floorboards. And so they made, they managed to make it into Fort Robinson with some guns, not very many, but with some guns. And so um, they were planning to escape. If they, if they wouldn't let them stay, they were going to escape and they were, they were going to die escaping. So on, so they got captured on October 25th, 1878. Um, on, in January 9th of 1879 was when they decided that they would escape. And so a, a lot of them are killed as they leave the fort. Um, but I need to say one other thing. While they were there, the army could not get control over the Indians. They refused to go south. And so they thought, well, well, we'll make you go south. We won't give you water. We won't give you food. And so they tried all these techniques to control them. Um, it didn't work. They decided to escape and they, and they didn't have enough weapons or anything. And it was snowing. It was freezing outside. And they, they took everything they could, made extra moccasins. And, uh, but, but they were, gonna, they were either going to escape or die trying. So... Um, an interesting note about that, um, some of the Indians made such a case over it, and the treatment was so bad that it was reported to President Rutherford Hayes. This guy's been really busy with the Indians, this president, and they ordered a board of officers to investigate, and um, it, resulting in, it resulted in the removal of the commanding officer of Fort Robinson, whose name was Captain Henry Wessels. And so he was dismissed from his um, duty there. So uh, ultimately, ultimately they let um, Dull Knife and his followers and Little Wolf and his followers, but they're greatly diminished now. They're just a just um, a few. I mean, much less than the thousand that they had. There was like a hundred and some left, and they they allowed them um, to stay up near Fort Robinson, they allowed him to go to Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, and then a few months later in March, Little Wolf and his followers surrendered near Yellowstone. And so um, they were also allowed to go to Pine Ridge. So because of all this carnage, um, the people in Kansas, people in Dodge City, the people in Oberlin, you know, I've told you about 31 people were killed and, and, um, women were raped. And so um, the state of Kansas decided to um, put Wild Hog and his group on trial for the crimes that they had committed. So this is, these are the seven that they captured. Um, this guy right here, his name is George Reynolds. He's an interpreter. Um, this is Wild Hog right here, sitting on the bottom step. So this was big news in Western Kansas. The problem was the trial was going to be near Topeka or Lawrence, which is the Eastern part of the state. So anyway, um, they, they, now that they've got the wild hog has, has um, surrendered. And now that they have him, they bring all these people, Sheriff Bat Masterson, Deputy Sheriff C.E. Bassett, um, James Masterson, all these key people to identify 
Wild Hog and his other, his six cohorts. So they get everybody there and they, and they start to have their preliminary trial. <laughs> this is really not funny. Um, and it was, it, it, the preliminary hearing was so unreliable and so bad that um, they could only, they, they were only to indict them on one murder charge. And that was for the, the killing of the postman, um, Washington O'Connor, outside Mead City, September 16th, 1878. The problem was they didn't actually have an eyewitness who could unequivocally state that they killed this man. Wild Hog on the other side, he was a very eloquent speaker. And he he spoke um, to the newspaper and to whoever would listen. He told them how bad it was. And it was bad. He, how badly they were treated at the Darlington Agency. How badly they were treated at Fort Robinson. And he actually got some people so sympathetic to their causes that all their charges were dismissed. There was no doubt these Indians had killed these people, raped these women, burned their houses, stole their horses. But the people in West in Eastern Kansas felt bad and the charges were dropped. So they just didn't handle that case very well. So to talk about, and that is he, his Indian name was Morning Star. Um, so just some a couple facts about Chief Dolnife. Um, he was married three times. His first wife was um, either goes to get a drink or well beloved. Somehow that's the same name. But anyway, that was her name. And um, when he took a second wife, his first wife hanged herself. Um, his second wife was the woman he stole, Pawnee Woman. Uh, she was captured by Dylan Life and he married her. Um, they had one son and four daughters. And then he married a third woman. Um, her name was Slow Woman. And she was the sister of Goes to Get a Drink. And they had two sons. Altogether, all he had 11 ch children, four sons and seven daughters. Um, in, the, in the exodus, in the escape, Slow Woman was and she was buried somewhere in Kansas. Well, she wasn't buried. She was put on the, what do you call that thing? The, they, they build the sticks up and they put them on top of it, whatever that thing's called. Um, and so anyway, ultimately Dolnife and his son, his, his, his oldest son was named Bull Hump. And he and Bull, Bull Hump spent their final years together up on the um, uh, Pine Ridge Reservation and after he died, he was buried there, and then he was moved and interred at um, the the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, and the college is at Lame Deer. There's a college up there named Dilna College, and he's buried in the cemetery there. So, do you guys have any questions? Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds, I know. That's up to us to kind of do more research. Well, I mean, there's so many, there's so many different accounts of different things and there's so many interesting, it's really hard to summarize it in a sense. I probably should have just picked a little piece and expounded on that. But um, like I say, Dee has been working on um, the genealogy of a lot of the, the settlers that were killed. I've been trying to do research on the military people um, and then the whole exodus our goal, we're hoping um, that there's there's a man who's a Northern Cheyenne. His name's Conrad, and he's working to get signed by the president of the Northern Cheyenne Nation to get national designation, and he's working on that. And so we're hoping that he succeeds. There's not a whole lot we can do about it. I mean, the people who need to get national designation is the Northern Cheyenne Nation. Um, and they'll have the best luck working with the federal government to do that. But we're hoping to do that. We're hoping to um, tell the story about the trail and not really saying who's right or wrong. I mean, there's a lot of bad going both sides, but just it's our history. Most people don't know it. And we just enjoy 
learning it and talking about it. So, yeah. Does the North, oh, pardon. Go ahead. Go ahead. Does the Northern Cheyenne have a reservation at Ashland, Montana? It's a it's, it's a lame deer. It's at lame deer. Lame deer. Ashland is on the reservation, but the actual point is lame deer. They're, they're in with the crow. I uh, know the crow reservation is right next door to it. Right next door. The reason I asked one of my uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I support the uh, Indian school. That's it's yeah. supposed to be uh, Cheyenne and uh, uh -huh. uh, crow. Yes. And they, uh, but I, they it's at Ashland. I Send the money. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm aware of Lane Deer. We um we talk with them quite regularly. Um, every um well, we just had the 145th an, uh, anniversary of Punish Women's Fork, and there will be the 150th in the intermediate years. Um, they do things out in Scott City, but um, we talk with um, various people from the Northern Cheyenne Tribe. Um, very small tribe. Don't have a lot of money. It's very poor. Very poor up there. So, yeah. Do you have a sense of how close they came to this area? Um, I, I know during the trail they were, that's pretty well marked, but in their hunting grounds, do you know if they've. Oberlin, hunted? yeah, Oberlin, at, you know, northern Kansas coming down to Scott City, you know, Ash, down to Ashland, that whole area. The trail itself covered five states. When you're talking about going from Oklahoma all the way up to Montana, but the part of Kansas. The closest probably we would be is Scott City. Because I have heard, uh, I'm, I've been researching my family homestead and who was there before, and I've heard that there was a young boy killed in 1868 or 69 just north and west of Concordia by a right. northern Cheyenne dog soldier. And Sarah White was taken captive by right. Cheyenne. Right. And so was that the northern Moore, Cheyenne or was that, like, do we know? I don't know if it's northern or southern. Sarah White ties into this whole story. When she was talking about when uh, Custer was, uh, they drew the line in the sand or, you know, to tell him that he would be killed. What happened there is Custer was, Custer was under Phil Sheridan and Phil gave him two assignments. He said, go down to the winter camp of the Cheyenne, which was the Washita, and he said to annihilate him. And that's what really, I mean, things were bad anyway, but that just kind of added fuel to the fire because they killed Dolmite, or not Dolmite, but they killed Black, uh, Kettle. Black Kettle. And Black Kettle was a peace chief, even though he was a Southern Cheyenne, they're, they're two separate tribes almost, but at the same time, there's a lot of cousins, so they travel back and forth each other. But, so that was assignment number one was to annihilate the Indians. Assignment number two was to go down to Sweetwater, Texas and bring Sarah and Anna Morgan back. And that's when he's down there and think of it sitting in a valley. And so here's Custer sitting in the valley. Here's, here's the Indians over there. And they invite him over to their camp and said, come on over and smoke the peace pipe. Well, Custer, for anybody that might think he was a little bit conceited, thinks, no big deal. I can handle this. You know, my interpreter happens to be sitting up on the ridge, but I don't need him. I'll go myself. So he goes to the teepees and he is smoking. Well, he wasn't a smoker. And he ends up, he's puffing this pipe for about half an hour and they're still going on and on. And he thinks all the time because he understands a little bit of sign language and a few of their words that he knows that they're talking peace. And that's why he's there. What he doesn't realize is they're smoking that peace pipe. And at the very end of the conversation, they drew a line, but they also tapped the ashes and dumped them on top of his boots. And that's when they told him, if you don't quit killing Sean, we will bury you. And that was the preface that set up everything for the little bighorn. And he kind of learned his lesson at the uh, wa wa the Washita about attacking a village that might have a, <laughs> a white uh, women or children because yep. they kill the uh, the ones that they had under their control right. when they attacked. So when he <laughs> caught up with them down there trying to get Sarah and Mrs. Morgan, uh, he ended up negotiating with them saying, hey, if you don't release them, they didn't attack the village, but they said, if you don't release the two girls, they actually had in their custody uh, uh, four Cappy chiefs. And they said, we'll hang them. And so if you don't get them, uh, get Sarah and the um, Mrs. Morgan, yeah. 
to us by a certain point in time, we'll, we'll hang the chiefs. And so um, that's how they end up negotiating the release of the, of the two ladies. Yes. I don't know what you think about Custer, but he also, he was married to Libby, but in this campaign, he also sort of captured an Indian woman, Monacita, and she became his, I don't know what, Mistress. Uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Was she also and she had a child. Yeah. That, yeah. And it's debatable whether it's his child or his brother's child or who's ever child, but and Libby knows about the woman. That's all really fascinating stuff. But that's Custer. But yeah, he's he's right in the middle of all this too. He's he's in the middle of it. And I can't remember which chief Mrs. Morgan became a bride of. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, because uh, once I mean they both uh, Sarah and her were abused. Yes, and and by the women even they beat them and gave them the hard jobs to do, but once she became the chief's bride, all she had to do was hold the reins of his horse when she was in camp, or when he was in camp. And uh, then the rest of the uh, women in the camp had to respect her and uh, treat her really good then from that point on. But, uh, yeah. That's what, when she got back here, there was a dispute over whose baby uh, she actually had. Yeah, you know, so you start researching and then you find out this, but then you start going down this little <laughs> rabbit hole talking about Monacita and it's like, I'm not doing Custer. <laughs> Come back. But I mean, it's, it's, and then, you know, you get the different stories, but the gist of it, and, and I think the people that you talked about, those people were killed in, in just the various skirmishes, you know, along, along the Smoky Hill Trail, along um, the Oregon Trail, you know, there was a lot of skirmishes there, but in 68, that was before they were, that was, that was a little bit before, but it all culminated to a big, big head after Little Bighorn. But and they were in this area, right? Yes, I mean, they came here to hunt. Yeah. Okay. This was their hunting grounds. They didn't not, live well, here. Not so much Cloud County. They I thought that was here. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. more Pawnee up here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's actually a, a report of two trappers down down by Glasgow, and uh, the Pawnee uh, party uh, came, uh, discovered them and said, "Hey, you need to get out of this area." Uh, the Cheyenne Braves asked us to go hunting with them, but we don't trust them. Uh, they said, well, they had to go get something, and he said, they're going to come back and paint them. And uh, so the Delaware left, and we did see the Cheyenne Braves, the war paint, coming through the valley looking for the Delaware. So, and you know, all this uh, stuff, like I say, if you guys have stories, we would love for you, if you want to share, we would love, love to and research them further. Cause like I said, I'm a, I'm not a historian yet. Not even close. In fact, I can't even stay on track, but, but it's fascinating stuff. And it's just, it's the most fun I've had, you know, just learning all this history and, 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 you know, when people say, well, it wasn't that way. And I'm like, okay, well, my source says this, you know, but, I think that if we get enough talk about it, number one, kids going to school will know what actually happened and, and we can, you know, we can have a dialogue about it. Cause I think it's a part of our history. We don't, we don't know about. So. Now uh, Mrs. Morgan down by Delta was actually taken captive by the Sioux that traded to the Cheyenne. I can't think of the author's name. I've been sitting here trying to think of her name, but she's written everything that she's written is just about different Indians. And, you know, I'm not sure how accurate historically it is, but she's trying to do every single Indian tribe. And, that's a lot um, of tribes. I did keep, I, what's her name? I said, that's a lot of tribes. Yes. Well, I read like 22 books of hers and I can't find them anymore. I think they've taken 
because of the controversy they're taking on lots of the Indian uh, and not just Indian but Jewish books and they're taking these out of the, because there's too much controversy. Civil War. Well, they well, want to erase your history. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You you can hide the books, but you can't hide history. Yeah, that you know. CRT stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's it's like, crazy. Well, that's like the castle. Uh, that was very good with the tax kill. They got good. They, uh, they were from Clifton, got a rear over into Mitchell County. But uh, when you look up the references, uh, the castle guys antagonized repeatedly uh, the different Indian tribe that came through here. That's the one called yeah. yeah. And so it, it's some, a lot of times that the Native American Indians would be okay, well, they can along. But, uh, if you're not going to respect them, then you're going to uh, steal their ponies, and which they did. Even uh, James Hageman, the founder of this community, harassed the Indians and stole ponies from them and stuff like that. Yeah, it, steal it, ponies from him, whatever. But, yeah, it goes. It went. It went both, both ways. ways. But uh, yes. they didn't respect them. They harassed them, and uh, so uh, like that honey party. I think that's the reason why they got wiped out, just because the way they were treated. Uh, yeah, when they were down here hunting. I read somewhere, I think it was a history of Buffalo County and Thomas Buffalo. And they went by and asked you if you'd seen Buffalo. And they carried on and they were drinking heavily when they passed through. They shot a slaughter child and let her free. And then went on to the death. And that's buried at the Binding Cemetery over here with the headstone with all the names on it. And there were the group of hunters that. Uh, the, the brave said, oh, come hunt with us. But they waited for the, uh, the white people to empty their guns. And then they attacked you know, the white hunters. So the story in my family, which is not related to this, but my family traded tobacco on the Santa Fe Trail. And their story is that they would, sometimes the Indians would come up and they would want something. So they would give them like maybe meat and the Indians toss that side, they don't want the meat. And then they would give them something else, they didn't want that. And so then they would call my family who, who did tobacco, and then they wanted the tobacco. So they gave them, you know, they kind of, you kind of had to do a little bit of trade a lot of times. And if you gave them something, then you could carry on your work. Um, it, it was really funny how they wrote it up. They gave them the tobacco, and the Indians just smoked it to beat the band. <laughs> Okay, but <laughs> so, but you know that that's you know that's my family story, which I found interesting. But you know, you hear these stories, but then when you read them in a book or you read them in some other journal, you're like, oh my god, that's my you know, or like you say, that happened here. So it, it makes it real personal and, and super interesting. So, but I don't know what kind of Indians they were. Quite a horse thievery area from, from uh, on west clear to into Missouri, and they were actually stealing the Native American Indian horses that were being given to them by the government. And so he had to track those down, and he found some of them right here. This area and stuff like that. <laughs> Was that your uncle? Probably. So. <laughs> <laughs> She's a troublemaker. I tell you what. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I, I just, like I say, you have to just like tell me to shut up. Stop talking. But I love the topic. I love the interaction. There are refreshments over here, coffee, tea, and cookies and all kinds of goodies. So help yourselves. So are you from here? Last couple. But I mean, have you been here all your life? Or yeah, most of them. Most of your life? So what did you do? What did you do before you retired? Well, another engineer, another engineer. You know, I have a lot of, uh, I mean, I'm an engineer. I've, I've been a lot more fun doing stuff than I ever was doing that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, we just we just oh, worked with Jerry Thomas, who's an artist out there. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. an historian, but he's one of my he's one of my best friends. So that's how we got into Stop City. That was our microfilm reader that took her away. That's what my Stop City reader used to do. A guy named Long Hanson out there in the middle of the night. Real, real, real. How do you get out there? Yeah, that's really peculiar. 
Oh, okay, that's the one that we work with. Yeah, we put our articles in these paper. Yeah, right there on Main Street. I got it online, and I, I just got my first copy, and I haven't read it yet. <laughs> yeah. I can't find it. I kind of like to know. I, I just think we should all be able to discuss our feet. We should all be able to disagree. I don't okay. so, no, 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 Do you live in the cloud village? So. Dude, I work there sometimes. I just want to do it. With McMillan? No, we just go there a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we, we know we <laughs> so long. Jack, yeah, and clean for Jack, and 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 the two youngest are little redheads. Yeah, they're they're bigger now. They're teenagers. Oh no! My son graduates high school next year. Are those are those the Are those in our city? Where the airport are they fully Oh, Those were the ones that disagreed with the most, you know. I mean, like the Chinese kind of send the king up to therapist and the therapist. 